interpretation, origins, practices, and responses to a changing world. If you want to keep in touch with us, you can send an email to humanities at uwyo.edu. I will type that address into the chat box and we'll add you to our mailing list. You can also see the recordings of our past events on our YouTube channel and we'll add that link there also. Okay, ready to go. Tonight's moderator is Millward Simpson, Wyoming Humanities Board Member and Executive Director of the National Association for Interpretation. Please help me welcome Millward and our speakers. Millward, the floor is yours. I thank you very much, Ken. I'm very excited about tonight's installment of the Think and Drink discussion series. And tonight we'll be looking at the uniquely compelling communicative art form practiced in parks, in zoos, in aquaria, in museums, in nature centers, at historic sites, on tour buses, and in wide varieties of other settings. First of all, I would like to mention that I am moderating from our national headquarters in Fort Collins, Colorado. And our organization, the National Association for Interpretation acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade gathering and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land. I'd also like to give just a very quick shout out to my fellow board members with Wyoming Humanities. This is your statewide nonprofit organization that strengthens Wyoming's democracy through the humanities. I'd like to thank Scott and Ken and the Wyoming Institute of Humanities Research for this very engaging series. And I'd like to talk just very, very briefly before I introduce our marvelous panel about the association that I am privileged to be the executive director for, the National Association of Interpretation. We are a national nonprofit and we are dedicated to advancing the, prefer the profession of heritage interpretation. We currently serve about 6,000 members in the United States, Canada, and over 30 nations. Our mission is to inspire leadership and excellence to advance heritage interpretation as a profession. And our vision is to be recognized as the voice for interpretation. And at this point, without any further ado, I'm so pleased and excited at this amazing panel of practitioners, planners, scholars, thought leaders, experts on interpretation and I'll briefly uh, introduce them to you and ask them to add anything they would like. First of all, Dr. Larry Beck. He is a professor at the L. Robert Payne School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at San Diego State, former National Park Service employee, author of numerous books, and he is a recipient of NAI's highest honor, the Fellow Award. Larry, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, please. So I've been at San Diego State University for uh, 40 years now. And as you mentioned, previously worked um, for the National Park Service. I was at Cabrillo National Monument and Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and Denali National Park and Preserve. So uh, just some, some beautiful landscapes. And of course, uh, Kelly is a kindred spirit still working for the national parks. Uh, I also want to uh, present uh, land acknowledgement, the uh, university that I teach at and my home and this entire San Diego County region are on the ancestral lands of the Kumeyaay people who inhabited this area and took care of these lands for millennia and who are still here contributing to our civic and cultural lives. And then I have one more thing to add because um, we had a planning session for this event last week and we discovered that Scott is a kindred spirit, that he teaches a senior seminar, and I love this title. His course is A Better World is Possible. And that ultimately is what interpretation is all about for a better world. Well spoken as always, sir. And now it's my privilege to introduce to you Kelly English. And this is a mouthful, everyone. She is 
all simultaneously, the Chief of Interpretation, Education, and Outreach for John Muir National Historic Site, Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site, Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial, and Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historic Park in the San Francisco, California East Bay area. And Kelly, you are freshly returned from a, a solemn and uh, sentimental occasion uh, at Rosie the Riveter, correct? Indeed, um, Millward. And I, I should compliment you on saying all of those names correctly and very smoothly. It gets, it gets more smooth the more you do it, but uh, it's a mouthful for most people. So I appreciate that very much. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Unfortunately, I, I literally just walked in the door from attending a memorial service for one of our Rosie, uh, or one of our Rosies. Um, we have these amazing folks who are in their 90s and still active and engaged. And, and we've been fortunate the last 20 years or so of the park's existence to feature them telling their own stories and really um, helping us to understand um, their contributions to the World War II home front. And so our Rosies are living primary sources and they are dear to us. And it, we know they're in their 90s, but it, we're never really prepared to lose them. And so I've, I've spent the afternoon at the service and with uh, with our Rosie's family and, and looking for ways how we, that we can help keep her legacy alive through interpreta the interpretation that she loved to do so much. So, um, so yes. <laughs> I should mention too that um, in the East Bay where our four sites are all situated maybe about 30 minutes from each other, um, but they do sit on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone, um, uh, who are not federally recognized, but we, uh, we recognize them and try to work with them in various ways out here in the East Bay. And Kelly has, uh, has just demonstrated how interpretation inspires to engage our humanity. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Don Enright. He's from our Ontario, Canada, and he is a freelance interpretive planner, experience advisor. Perhaps you'll enlighten us more, Don, on what an experience advisor does. Travel writer, award-winning blogger of Canadian travel culture who for nearly 40 years has brought diverse skills and services to the interpretation industry. He's also a former board member of the National Association for Interpretation. We're just delighted to have you with us tonight, Don. Uh, thanks very much, Millward. And uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for letting me hang out with you. Uh, I'm actually on, on the West Coast. I'm in British Columbia. And uh, I'm speaking to you from Maine Island, which is on uh, unceded Coast Salish territory. Uh, experience, I'm a visitor experience advisor. And uh, so if you think of when we're trying to look at interpretation, it's in the context of the greater visitor experience. And one of the trends we might talk about is this idea of shifting back from looking strictly at interp to how interp fits into the entire visitor experience cycle. And that's kind of a lot of the work that I'm doing now is that sort of paradigm shift. We can talk about that in a bit. Hi, everyone. Fantastic. Well, we are aspiring to do a lot this evening. We'd like to talk about the origins of this uh, communicative art form, the practices, uh, and how interpretation responds to a changing world. So perhaps in terms of origins, I will call on our August scholar, Dr. Beck, to help us out here. And maybe I'll see just a little bit of an introduction for our audience of humanists who may not be as familiar with interpretation and its origins. Um, I will give the current practice definition that we use at NAI. Interpretation is a mission-based communication process that engages people by forging emotional and intellectual connections between the interests, experience of the audience, and the meanings inherent in the resource, a definition that harkens back to early origins of interpretation in the form of one of its great uh, fathers and champions, Freeman Tilden, clear back in the 50s and 60s. Larry, what can you do to help uh, kind of orient our audience around interpretation? Well, oh, it, it's such a, a tough question, actually. And Ted Cable and I, uh, back in 2003, wrote an entire article titled The Meaning of Interpretation. And then that book that Scott held up for us, uh, chapter one is titled What is Interpretation? So uh, we've written articles, we've writ written chapters. Um, it, it, it's hard to, to put it in a nutshell. 
but I've actually been thinking about this a lot over the past week. And there are lots of definitions. Freeman Tilden wrote many. Uh, Sam Hamm wrote one that's very similar to the NAI one. Uh, also uh, excellent. But, but for our purposes, uh, I came up with something for this evening. And uh, so this is, this is my definition. Interpretation is the sharing of stories, science-based and historically accurate, that inspire people, often at the very sites the stories took place. And then I want to follow that up with a story. So we've got one more definition, <laughs> uh, as if we needed it. But um, a couple of years ago, the executive director of the San Diego Museum of Art decided to invite a local philanthropist for a one hour interpretive tour of the museum. And so the philanthropist agreed and went on the tour. And afterwards he said he was just astounded that he never could have imagined the great value of art in our human history and to uplift the human spirit. And so later uh, he donated one and a half million dollars to the San Diego Museum of Art. So I like to say interpretation is worth a million dollars. And I think that as we continue with the, uh, the panel here tonight, what we'll discover is that it's actually worth more than that. It's priceless. Wonderful. And Don and Kelly, uh, would you agree that telling stories is kind of the, the essence or the focus, or what would you add to what Larry has elucidated about our profession? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind, sure, stories are, are key. And you know, even just the example of the Rosies that we work with at Rose the Riveter, they, you know, people come and you know, pack the house, or at least pre-COVID times, we'll pack the house to come and hear them tell their stories. And so I think that that certainly is an important aspect of interpretation. But one thing I think that, that, that basing the entire definite, not to get semantic with definitions, but I think that basing the entire definition around stories runs the risk of only presenting the side of the stories of the resource because part of interpretation also involves connecting with the visitor and encouraging visitors to share their stories as well about what they find meaningful with these places that we all love. And so I think that that's one thing to remember to, that the storytelling should go both ways in, in a very real sense that, um, that you have you know, folks like like us who have dedicated our lives to interpretation and to telling these stories and helping make these connections, but but also remembering that that the audience, what the audience is finding of value is also an important aspect and that they have stories to share as well. And that we should give them give them a place on the stage, so to speak, to feature those perspectives. Thank you, Kelly. Wonderful. Don, any any thoughts of how to add to our tapestry of what we're what we're about here? Oh, I absolutely agree that um, storytelling is at the heart of what we do and uh, absolutely would like to uh, second what Kelly's suggesting that we're doing more and more two-way listening and telling and listening and telling, which brings me back to another uh, point that just uh, arose from um, what, what Dr. Beck was saying about this idea that interpretation is science-based and historically accurate. And uh, I would just like to flag that what we're doing a lot more of now is opening our minds to multiple ways of knowing. And I feel we get in a really dangerous terrain when we're defining things as science-based and historically accurate when, I mean, I agree, of course, we all want to present the best of what we know, absolutely. Uh, we spent a lot of time, spent a lot of time trying to do that. Uh, but there are multiple ways of doing and multiple histories. And this ties back to your definition of interpretation, uh, which is NAIs, which I'd like to point out is not universal. It's the American one and it's not even universal there. It's a good one. But the idea of meaning being inherent in a resource is another big red flag. There is no meaning inherent in a resource. We assign meaning to, uh, to the resource. We call that heritage, is the assigning of meaning. And there are many, many, many ways of doing so. We just have to be conscious of that, um, especially when we are holding ourselves up as authority figures, which interpreters just do. People look at us that way. We have to acknowledge that there are many ways of knowing and many, many meanings in any resource. Thanks. I'll hazard um, 
maybe a way to describe a spectrum, because I think this is just eternally fascinating about how we practice interpretation. So it's been variously described as on one end, you have unidirectional or this more didactic, sometimes we use the phrase the sage on stage, who's imparting knowledge that exists or is inherent uh, as Don was describing. And then the, on the other end, the more participatory, multi-directional, the idea that the meaning is actually a co-creation of the audience and its experience. So it seems to me that there's this um, kind of eternal spectrum that, our, that what we practice kind of falls along. Would you agree with that? And do you think that one spectrum is, is ascendant over the other? today or, or what's in, what do you think is the most effective place to land on a spectrum like that? I think the way you presented it, Millward, is uh, very articulate and I think that it is a spectrum. Uh, on the one hand, with uh, what's referred to as facilitated dialogue and Kelly sort of alluded to that uh, previously in her comments, uh, the sharing of stories back and forth with, with the audience uh, and, and the interpreter, that's important. Uh, and perhaps especially so, I would say, given the uh, situation we find ourselves in as a divided nation. Uh, we're, we're not agreeing on a whole lot of things right now. And so uh, this certainly has a place and could help, in fact, bring people together. And yet, on the other hand, I would suggest that there are times when, personally speaking, if I go somewhere, I would like to hear from the expert uh, about the place that I've come to visit. So again, there's a spectrum and there could be any range of possibilities in between. Kelly or Don? Yeah, and in some ways, I think it can be interesting to try to separate out style versus approach um, in terms of the idea that, you know, I, I think that one doesn't have to limit oneself to just taking one particular approach. I think in many ways, it really depends on what what, what, what the program is and what the aim of the program is. And um, there are times when, as, as, as Larry said, that a a lecture style may be more appropriate, but there's other times where a more, much more participatory style is much more appropriate. And so in some ways, I almost feel that interpreters should be prepared to do all of those types of approaches, depending on what the situation calls for, because there are certain topics that, you know, having a, a, a dialogue can be incredibly powerful. But then there's other topics where the audience may need a lot of information and doesn't have a lot of information. And there's many different ways of interpretive tools that you can use to do all kinds of programs. But I think that um, the best thing that interpreters can do is to be prepared to, to take a variety of approaches depending on the audience and depending on the subject at hand. Uh, I absolutely agree. And I think what's most exciting about doing interpretation right now is that we acknowledge we have all of these tools or styles at our disposal and we feel, feel free to use them. Whereas when I was starting out in a park, you know, a kid in a uniform, uh, I was expected to present and they were expected to listen. <clears throat> now, everybody still wants to learn. We know that people learn in different ways and on their own terms. And so we still have that freedom to share or to bring in the experts. And, and But what we know about interpretation now and what we do really well is this idea of helping people unpack their the knowledge that they bring in and the feelings that they bring in and then we are helping them think about things in new ways and uh it's like constructivist model of learning basically but in informal education does this really well because you're in the setting right you're standing there with the trees or you're standing there with you know a descendant of the uh, of the of the historic figure or whatever so your brain is just unpacking all of these things and then we bring in these techniques of dialogue or we bring in these techniques of hands-on learning and these are all ways of just reevaluating. Uh, and thinking and even the process of disagreeing with someone to say my lived experience is different from your lived experience and that experience of listening to each other will help us repack and connect with what we call the resource in new ways which is what makes it what we call interpretation or free choice learning or informal education 
so powerful. Uh, it's it's meaning making, as one of the participants said. That's that's a mantra of mine. I'm I'm here to help facilitate meaning making, and there are so many tools to do that. I'll, I'll introduce a couple of more words that you can all riff on that have um, really become important as well, and and seem to uh, have a have a lot of. Um, of power. And one is this notion that part of our job is to provoke. And another perhaps is the, is the notion that um, our job is partly also to engage the emotions and that um, at some point love comes into this. And I'll give a quick quote from Freeman Tilden. If you love the thing you interpret and love the people who come to enjoy it, you not only have taken pains to understand it, to the limits of your capacity, but you also feel its special beauty and the general richness of life's beauty. And I guess what I like about that is that people are going to, it seems to me, uh, understand and care about something more if truly their emotions have been engaged. And sometimes being part of making the meaning and making the meaning connect with something in your own life brings those kind of deep emotional connections to life. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you think of, of that proposition and if you've encountered that in your own experience as interpreters. Well, we just set a record for three interpreters not having anything to say for more than five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I've stumped them. <laughs> Yay, that was my secret goal. <laughs> uh, what, what I love about that quote is this notion of love and that uh, I, I think interpreters are somewhat of a rare breed. Uh, they're doing something for the love of it because there isn't generally, uh, you're not going to make a whole lot of money. You, you can have a good living wage but most interpreters are college educated, some with master's degrees, uh, even some with doctorates. And so uh, we're doing it for the love of the subject matter and because we enjoy working with people. And to that extent, we're very fortunate because a lot of people aren't doing what they love to do. Uh, and uh, <laughs> many who come to, uh, let's say the Kelly sites at the National Park Service uh, we'll, we'll ask the, the park rangers, how is it that you got so lucky to get this sort of job? Uh, that especially happens if you're at Yellowstone, as Kelly has been, or Denali, uh, as I've been, and so on, or on cruise ships, as Don has been. How do you get this work? So I, I think Freeman Tilden is correct. We, we have a passion for the work that we do. And what happens is that by having that passion, you're more able to engage an audience and have them come along with you. Uh, so that would be my two cents. I definitely agree. But um, when I train interpreters sometimes, and for those of you who aren't interpreters and don't know the full spectrum of our profession, when we talk about interpretation, like it can be an app, it can be a sign on the wayside, it can be a book, it can be all, it's not just personal interpretation. So when I talk to live interpreters, people who do this, often I point out that interpreters are actually, we're expensive and we're high maintenance and we're unpredictable. So why use live interpreters? Why? <laughs> and the answer is that, uh, that, that interpreters model passion. They model enthusiasm. They model their love of their work. And we haven't invented a non-personal medium that can do that quite as well yet. And so that's why interpreters are worth gold, as you say. Um, but I will point out as well that define love. Uh, I really want to point out that it is, it is entirely possible to interpret something without loving the subject matter. It's impossible to interpret something without endorsing it. And we need to remember that because some of us interpret painful history, difficult history, and uh, historical figures that were once considered to be the paradigms of virtue, and we now know them to not be so much anymore. And so we need to let go of this fact that I no longer need to be a salesperson in Canada for Johnny McDonald. I can liberate myself of that and begin to delve into some of his, he was our first prime minister, for those of you, the 99% of you in the room. <laughs> anyway, um, there's some ugly stuff there. And I no longer have to feel like I love him 
in order to represent him as an interpreter. What a I'm wonderful really way to... Don made the point that I was trying to make earlier about that, you know, it, it kind of goes back to that first question about storytelling and um, the danger I think in basing it around storytelling is that there's so many different ways to tell stories and they don't necessarily involve someone on a stage. We tell stories through our exhibits and through our media that we produce, through our, through our mini documentaries, through, through mini videos that get posted on Snapchat. I mean, we, we tell stories in so many different ways um, in interpretation and it's not the traditional, you know, around the campfire setting. And as someone pointed out in the chat, there's always an interpreter behind every sign, every video, every app. And so, um, you know, so we, we tell stories, but we tell it in very different ways with very different types of media. Um, and emotion definitely comes into it. I think that when in, audiences can tell when there's, when the passion isn't there. You know, you don't always, you don't have to have the same style. You don't have to be, you know, extremely extroverted and engaging. In fact, most interpreters are not actually extroverts, um, but everyone has their own style and has their own way of conveying their passion. And that passion can come across in a face-to-face -face program. It can come across in the care with which a particular media, um, video, you know, a social media video is put together, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the emotion is there. And we talk about emotional connections as well as intellectual connections a lot in interpretation. And so it's not just about engaging your brain, but it's about engaging your heart and, and, and helping visitors find that aspect of a, a site, of, of a resource, of wherever they are, that really hits them in, in their heart in whatever way. And so, so yeah, I, you know, it, you know, the authenticity aspect, I think, does come into play with interpretation that the audiences can tell when the, uh, when the, when the, when the passion is not authentically there. But luckily for our profession, we tend to have a lot of folks in this profession who are very passionate about what, about what they do. And, and so we don't usually have, you know, I suppose it's possible to have a problem with a lack of passion, but we don't have that problem too much in our field because we do believe so strongly in, in the resources that we're interpreting and the, the meaning in bringing those two folks and helping them connect. Well, thank you, Kelly. And speaking of passion, uh, the chat will reveal a lot of passionate adherence to um, various points on the spectrum we, we spoke about which I think shows the richness of our field and in terms of the, the, the spectrum of ways that uh, it, it can be practiced. Um, Don uh, kind of launched us into this other portion of what we wanted to talk about tonight, which is interpretation as a response to a changing world. I'm gonna seed this just a little bit more. I'm fascinated to hear uh, your responses to this. A lot has been just spoken and written about the fact that we are unfortunately living in a, a world, um, a post-truth era where scientific empirical understanding, where shared understanding is, uh, is less important, it seems, and where we're losing our ability to find a common framework of facts, facts uh, that we can agree on. Um, what is the what is the role that an interpreter steps into in this day and age to try to address this phenomenon? And what challenges does encountering visitors in this post-truth era bring to you as you're trying to impart real uh, factual knowledge about a place? That was a two-part challenging question, so. <laughs> Well, the, the one part of it, Millward, I think it, it's just so difficult right now because we are dealing with uh, misinformation. We are dealing with uh, uh, people who are not necessarily acknowledging reality. Uh, there are conspiracy theories out there. Uh, our country here in the United States is in turmoil. Uh, because of some things that are going on that have to do with the, the lack of truth. Uh, and, and we have, have seen this uh, now for some time. So it, it's a real challenge. Uh, I've been reading a book, it's called Think Again by Adam Grant. And he says that we need to all be taking a scientific lens to uh, our thinking and that by doing so, uh, we're more likely to acknowledge that we may not have all the answers 
and I think that's probably important for all of us, and particularly uh, interpreters. But uh, I, I think that this is something that is a problem. I, I don't believe there are easy answers. Yeah, I agree with Larry that I really don't think that there are any easy answers. It's it's challenging. You know, there are things that have. Um, you know, there, there are things that have become politicized that should never be political. And, you know, in many cases, there have been direct collisions with those, those things and many of the resources that we are charged with preserving, protecting, and interpreting them. And it, it, it definitely becomes a real challenge when you have such a polarized environment societally that folks don't even want to listen to each other, that they, there's a reluctance out there to entertain different points of view in this type of environment, which, which really runs against a lot of what we are supposed to be doing as interpreters, which is to acknowledge and, and, and discuss and, 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 and look at things from many different points of view. You know, we, as someone in the chat just said, I think that's John Cole, uh, that there are multiple ways of knowing. And it is challenging when, um, when some of these ways seem to be based on things that are not not cultural traditions, not uh, not not historical facts, not science, not you know they, they seem to come from 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 things that we don't tend to value very much, and it's it is it is tricky of how we can do this in a way that we still engage our audiences even knowing that some of them have are working with a very different concept of what truth is and what reality is. I don't know that we have any real. I don't know that anyone's really figured out how to do this well <laughs> just yet, but I think that all we can do is to pull on all of our tools of um, that we use in the trade in terms of in terms of you know presenting things different ways, different styles, giving providing enough there for folks to still connect with the resources and you know walk away making their own connections, even if it's not one that that we might agree with personally, um, and and being okay with that. You know, we're we're not necessarily here to make sure that everyone walks away with an exact understanding of, of, the, of the science behind the biology of a, you know, of, of a sequoia, for example. But I think that we, it, to some degree, we need to make our peace with the fact that not all visitors and audience members are going to take away what we would like for them to take away. But in the end, maybe that doesn't matter so much because if, if they forge a connection that's meaningful to them, that will benefit our resources and our sites in the long run. And I think we just have to have to make peace with that and keep keep working on how how to do this in this kind of environment. There's something that just came into the chat box and it, it touches on what we're talking about here and I, I think it's important and I, I think what's happening in interpretation, Mary, is hopeful in that various interpretive sites are now telling a fuller and more comprehensive story of our nation's history. Now, Kelly is doing this in, in the sites where she works, and I'm actually really looking forward to hearing about John Muir, uh, which we talked about in our planning session a week ago. But, but I'd like to point out that in uh, a number of places, including museums, plantations, historic sites, uh, churches of the civil rights movement, uh, all of these places are now telling a, a broader story that is more accurate. And although it might make some people uncomfortable, it's something that's very important if we are going to reach a point of healing. And I've got a couple of examples, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. It's a Smithsonian museum and it opened in 2016. Uh, We've got the Whitney Plantation, which instead of interpreting the big house is interpreting enslavement on a sugar plantation just outside of New Orleans. It opened in 2014. James Madison's Montpelier uh, opened in 2017, an exhibit called The Mere Distinction of Color about enslavement uh, at James Madison's estate. And uh, at Jefferson's Monticello, 2018, an exhibit now which tells the Sally Hemings story. And so I think it, it's interesting and I see another um, um, member uh, of the audience, uh, Brady has said that he's been to Whitney. It, it is an extraordinary site. 
uh, as it turns out, my girlfriend and I started exploring these interpretive sites a couple of years ago. The, the pandemic sort of put a hold on some of the research we were doing, but we went to all of the sites that I mentioned, and then I started writing a series of columns for Legacy Magazine, and that's uh, the the journal for the National Association for Interpretation. And these are under the banner of Justice for All. And so what, what my purpose was is to investigate what we're doing in the interpretive field to address social justice issues. And again, this is happening right now. It is relatively new. And the history, of course, goes back, well, in some instances, 400 years, uh, and yet we're just now talking about these things that I think and hope will shift us to a more caring and unified nation. Thank you, Larry. And um, Kelly, not to put you on the spot, but John Muir has been in the news recently. And I think we're very fortunate that we have you with us tonight and that you uh, interpret the, the, his, the site. Uh, with his name, and in, in terms of the uh, one of the themes of this conversation about um, telling a more diverse, more more broad, inclusive story um, when uh, we learn different and more in more about uh, that more things about what we thought we knew that really challenge us. Um, can I put you on the spot and ask you to share what? your experience of, of this has been? Sure, but before you do that, I need to just show off my Whitney Plantation water bottle that I just happen to have next to me. <laughs> it was not planned. <laughs> it just happens to be the water bottle I have right now. Nice. Um, that uh, just to, to shout out to the Whitney that we're doing in the chat as well as here. Um, I should mention too that the reason why a lot of NAI members are very familiar with Whitney Plantation is that two years ago, three years ago, when we had the conference in New Orleans in 2018, um, the Whitney was one of the destinations for one of the offsite trips. And so a lot of us got to go to that plantation and compare it with another one that was nearby and had an amazing tour and a really powerful sense of what that kind of inter interpretation can be like. It was it was unforgettable, I think, for everyone that was on that. And so I, it's, it, it is a unique site down there. Um, yeah, so John Muir's been in the news lately, which is impressive considering how long he's been gone. Uh, but um, but in, in, in we John Muir is a small site. There are a number of sites in the Park Service that do interpret John Muir. You know Yosemite, there's Muir Woods, and the John Muir National Historic Site is the place where Muir lived with his wife and his two children. And he's that was his home that he came back to after all of his travels. And um, and we've long known that John, some of John Muir's writings are, shall we say, typical of the perspectives of um, white men of privilege of that time in terms of how um, they thought about um, non-white folks in general. There, there are things in um, many of his published, a few of his published works that do allude to this. Um, My First Summer in the Sierra, he has some very uncomplimentary things to say about Native Americans living in Yosemite Valley. Um, and I guess things we've, we, we've known this for many years, but it really kind of hit the media pretty strongly last summer. It's kind of off and on for a couple of years, but especially last summer um, when they were, uh, the Sierra Club came out, was it last? You know, I have to say the pandemic is causing me to lose track of when is when what is happening, but the Sierra Club <laughs> surprised us in the middle of the pandemic and came out with this. They didn't let us, they didn't talk to us about it before they did it, which they didn't have to, but it would have been nice to have a heads up um, before we had media crews staking out our site. Um, and they announced, they basically published a very open letter announcing and saying that um, that Muir had a lot, had some of these writings that they disavow that they found problematic and that they were, you know, and that started this whole conversation about was John Muir a racist and, and are we, are we canceling Muir and things like that. So, um, so I have a couple of interesting things to say about that. First of all, one of the things that we had to make very clear to our staff when we had reporters calling pretty quickly is that we are not in the business of defending Muir. Muir's writings state stand for themselves. We are not in the business of defending. We're not. We're not going. To, I, I think it's a mistake to try to um, put too much of the Sierra Club controversy on Muir. Muir is 
the best known member of a group of preservationists and very famous conservationists and preservationists, many of whom were involved with the eugenics movement, actually. Muir was not, but many of his contemporaries were. And some of them have written whole books on um, about about these topics that are far worse, in my opinion, my personal opinion, than, than the few sentences here and there that you can point to where Muir, um, where Muir says uncomplimentary things about folks. Um, so in some ways, Muir is kind of taking the heat for that entire group of early conservationists and preservationists, some of which he probably deserves and some of which he probably doesn't because he was, he was not involved with some of what they were involved in. So we're not really here to defend Muir and we're not really here to, to condemn him either. I think that it really is an example of how, like it or not, this is part of Muir's legacy. And we need to really take a look at um, the impact of his words. Because to me, the question of, you know, was, was a, a, a wealth, well, he married into his wealth. Maybe many people don't really know that. Muir did not grow up in privilege. He actually married, um, uh, he married a woman who, ended up inheriting a lot of money from her parents. And it was that financial support from his wife that enabled him to actually be the advocate that he was and to, just, and to travel and to write and everything else. And so he, he certainly exercised privilege in that context. Um, and it's not surprising that he would have had some of those perspectives of, um, of Natives, Native Americans not being equal to Caucasians and African Americans not being equal to Caucasians. That was sort of, that, that, that was what everybody thought at the time, more or less, or, or many people at the time. So that's not really a very interesting question to me of was Muir a racist or just how racist was John Muir? Although I think that that will certainly be the topic of many dissertations. And, and to be honest, we are working with the University of Pacific, of the Pacific, where, which has most of Muir's papers um, to really dig into some of his writings and see what they may have to offer into some insight into this issue because it is from an academic perspective an interesting question but from an interpretive perspective i don't think it is i think the question of was neuro racist is not very exciting i think that what is more interesting is what does it mean for the field of conservation that so many of its early founders of the field, so many of our founding fathers of the fields of preservation and, and conservation and, and in national parks, what does it mean that so many of these folks had these perspectives and had these views? What does that mean? What does it say? What are the, what are the current impacts of the entire system that we have of preserving these special places, the fact that it was conceived of and designed by wealthy white men? Could that have something to do with the fact that 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 visitation and um, and a diverse workforce are still not what we would like them to be in these fields? You know, th th there may be a connection there. And so, to me, the question of how racist was John Muir is is not that's not the conversation I want to have. I want to have the conversation of what what are the so what are the bigger implications of John Muir having fought the way that they did that he did. He certainly wasn't right about everything. You know, we know that he he had, for example, the impact of fire on the natural landscape. He had no conception of of the role that fire has played in 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 in, in cult in really shaping the landscape. That was not something that was well understood at the time that he was a naturalist. And so Muir certainly wasn't perfect. He didn't know everything, and he made plenty of mistakes. We need to really take these sorts of figures down off of the pedestals that we've kept them on all these years and, and look at their legacy with a critical eye and really ask those broader questions. And so that's the conversation we wanna be having about John Muir and his writings. And, and, and I think it's important that folks understand what it means to, people, to visitors of color to read those writings from Muir. And to, like, how does that make us feel? How does that, does that make me feel comfortable coming to the John Muir site knowing that that John Muir wrote disparaging things about African Americans while he was on his 1,000 mile trek to the Gulf. You know, I, I think that it's important that we understand the impact that that does have today on people who read those writings and that we, and that we give them the space to articulate that and that we talk about what it means for this field. I know I've talked a long time, but I, I also wanna share one quick story, which is that when this whole craziness blew up <laughs> last summer. Um, there were, we had, a, we were, we were pretty busy working with different folks. And um, there was kind of an email thread that was going with myself and Shelton Johnson from Yosemite and a lot of Muir historians. Um, and 
the Muir historian community in general did not really react very well to this Sierra Club letter. It actually caused a lot of division. And there were a lot of historians that were jumping to defend Muir in any way possible. And they went so far that one of them on email put out saying, hey, I found this reference of one of Muir's travel journals where he's talking about these two folks from, um, from was it Eritrea? I think from 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 at one of the an East African country where he was going through, and he called them a new kind of monkey men. And, and what do we do with this? And and believe it or not, one of the historians on that thread actually went so far as to say that to try to argue that well, you know, John Muir had a different perspective than most people. He actually viewed animals as being superior to humans, and so he was actually you know kind of complimenting these guys when he was comparing them to monkeys. And I sat there and I thought, I don't think there's any way I can actually write an email response to this <laughs> that's going to be the right reaction. And so I ended up calling up the gentleman in question and saying, you, you need to stop <laughs> because you are going so far down this road of trying to defend Muir that you are actually being offensive. And we had a really good discussion and he apologized and, and, and we, we talked about it. But it's just like, I, I understand that you want to defend Muir, but Muir's dead. He can take the heat, right? And we really <laughs> need to really look at what, what does this mean? And I think that some of you who adore Muir need to really make peace with the idea that yes, this guy had the same kind of generally racist perspectives that many other folks had at the time. That is not, that is not, new to many of us who've been looking at and thinking of these issues critically, but it is something that it's hard to take your heroes down off their pedestals and to have take the halo off. And I think that that is something that this field is going to continue to reckon with. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's long past time, you know, and I had to, I, I mean, I had to literally say to this guy, look, Muir did not live in a bubble. I know you like to think that he was in his own world in the Sierras, but he would have been aware of the, of the traveling minstrel shows at the time where they had folks from different areas of the African continent that they displayed in cages like animals. Like he would have been aware of this kind of thing happening around him. He was not removed from, re from, from the broader world, even though it may sound like that in his travel journals, but being at the site where he came home to and lived with his wife and family, went to you know, all kinds of things in the Bay Area like most people do. And he, he was not, he didn't just live in the woods within his own little world. He certainly was aware of these broader things. It is interesting that he didn't write much about certain issues. Um, one of the things that Shelton Johnson, and I think is very interesting that we cannot find any record of him ever writing about the Buffalo Soldiers, even though he must have run across them from time to time while he was in the city. And the fact that he chose not to write about them is interesting all by itself. You know, So these are the kinds of things that I think we can have some really fascinating discussions on this topic that dig into Muir's legacy and really try to, try to explore the, and, and, you know, and Muir did some great things. He could not have done the great things he did if he hadn't focused on what he did. But it doesn't mean that we have to think that he was superbly enlightened on every topic of the time. And this is one where I think we just need to, we need to let his words speak for themselves and talk about what they mean today. So That's, that was uh, long, I apologize, but. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, Kelly, for that uh, very, uh, uh, very in-depth, thoughtful response, and I think we're seeing that reflected in the chat. I'm really uh, pleased with the uh, the uh, um, amount of questions that are being asked. Uh, clearly, we have uh, provoked a lot of thought this evening, and I appreciate everyone for weighing in. Don, you had a kind of a visceral reaction to part of what Kelly was saying. <laughs> I wanted to ask you uh, generally where um, uh, making an attempt to emphasize a more diverse story kind of lands for you and your work and any reaction to what you've heard that you'd like to share with us. But it's, thank you. It, it's the core of like, so, so I work now as a planner. I've worked in all kinds of different aspects of interpretation, but now I work as a planner. It's the, it's the core of my work now is how do we do exactly what Kelly was just saying, take these uh, really, really um, problematic histories and make them relevant today and deal with them constructively right and i just want to support 100 percent kelly what you were saying about this idea that we can talk for hours days about was this person good or evil you know the answer is yes okay we're done and so the question then the fruitful ground is what did they leave us today and why are the why are these conversations so uncomfortable right and that's where the good stuff happens to say you know we've got a legacy whether it be john muir johnny mcdonald anybody else, they have left us, they've shaped who we are today and we carry them inside us for better or for worse. And that's what we need to start talking about, 100%. 
I want to say too, I want to um, call out a comment that was made quite a while ago in the chat, but that was really, I thought really powerful um, about, um, about that, uh, <laughs> that some of these seeming contradictions are things that many folks have been wrestling with for a long time. Anyone who is a member of a group that has had challenge, that has had to somehow reconcile um, the promise that this country is supposed to have with their own lived and their familial experiences. I mean, there are a, there is, is possible to hold multiple truths and 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 deal with them. And we need to talk about those. You know, John Muir can have been an incredible visionary for his time with regard to preservation and also have been a very typical rich white man when it came to <laughs> racist issues. And it's possible to hold those two truths at the same time. And you know, and I think that to some degree, you know, we, I think a lot of people prefer a very simplistic perspective, but let's face it, the world is not simple. It is complex and it is nuanced. And to be honest, we do our audiences a disservice if we assume that they can't handle that. And, and too often, that's what they crave. They want to talk about the nuances. They want to discuss them. They want to, they want help wrestling with them themselves, you know? And, and I think that if we, when we embrace that, then, then it doesn't mean that it is easy to talk about these challenging topics, but it does mean that we need to be all in on doing so and that we can do so without without alienating wide swaths of our audiences you know we can be on that journey with them in terms of how to talk about these these issues and, and wrestle with these multiple truths so the halos can perhaps be large enough to accommodate uh, a, a more broad kind of story and uh, it's very interesting to me i wanted to mention that briefly because i know my mom's on tonight and she is an award-winning theater artist in Wyoming, and I think it would be hard to wrest the halo from Eugene O'Neill for her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one to talk about. Talk about a flawed person. Wow. Brilliant genius, but very troubled in so many other <laughs> Well, I'm a, there's a, one more thing I really want to bring up here uh, while we have time, and I have a very passionate staff, and you know, we're all kind of fanatics here. I mean, we live and breathe interpretation day in and day out, and our longest serving staff member, Paul Caputo, um, believes that interpretation can save the world. It's like, Paul, we're going to do it. We're going to do it, but we have to do these things and these things. Be patient, man. We're going to get there. But uh, so uh, let me just propose that to you and ask you to respond. Can interpretation help save the world? If so, why and how? I'm gonna take a drink from my Whitney Plantation water bottle and let someone else tackle that first. <laughs> what do you think, Larry? I, yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, and and I, I guess looking at the time, I, I know we were going to hope to get in a closing statement uh, I yeah. could wrap, wrap this into my closing statement, if you'd like, or do you want me to hold off? Well, why don't, uh, why don't we riff on this for a little while before we go to closing statements? Okay. That's okay. Sure, sure. Don, please. Sure, we can save the world. Uh, if you hold, I mean, that's what gets me out of bed every day, right? If you hold this idea that that learning and connecting and listening to each other is a way forward, I, I base my career on that, right? That we can listen and learn from history. And we can listen and learn from nature and we can listen and learn from each other. And interpreters are masterfully placed at facilitating those connections. When a bunch of interpreters get in a room though, we get really rah-rah with each other and, and we get saying these ridiculous things to each other like interpretation is inherently noble or inter inter interpretation is inherently a force for good. And I just want to point out that interpretation can save the world, but it can be used for evil. It has been used for evil and we have spent the last hundred years erasing indigenous histories, erasing queer histories, erasing the histories of underrepresented people throughout all of these stories, right? And so all of that bring to the forward to what Kelly was saying, what does that mean? What am I carrying? I, I lie awake nights going, what kind of crap am I saying now that I just am not really clear enough yet that somebody 50 years down the line is gonna say, holy crap, that was evil shit. And I didn't know it, right? So. We have to be really careful about this patting each other on back going we're doing good everybody no let's check ourselves let's check ourselves every once in a while we're not necessarily doing good humility excellent larry kelly what do you think 
I, I think, I guess to follow up uh, with what Don said is that we're trying to do good. And uh, that's the best we can do, I suppose, is to get up every morning and do what we feel is our calling to, to make the world better. Uh, I, I wrote something in Legacy Magazine. It was called Keeping Our Democracy Intact. And it had to do with how in interpretive sites, we can promote patriotism in, in the proper sense of that word and uh, to advocate for democracy. And so uh, I, I think we try to do good. And I, I think that, that wins out over um, any, any negative that, that, that might come uh, later on. Yeah, I think sometimes we have to <clears throat> remember too that we may not, it may not be immediately obvious to us that we are doing something impactful in, in a given interpretive setting, whether it be a program or a video or something else. Um, but so much of what we do is we plant seeds. We plant seeds for thought. We, we plant seeds that sometimes sprout immediately because they're that, you know, the, the, there's that much provocation that it immediately starts to sprout. But sometimes the seeds we plant have to, you know, they, they, lay, they may lay dormant for a while. And so I think that's something to remember is that um, that even, the, the, yes, I agree that interpretation can save the world. Um, I think that good interpretation is really the only thing that ever has saved things sometimes. Uh, if you think back and people who didn't have a name for what they were doing, but they were interpreting things. And I think that we just need to remember that there's some, some of this is a long-term process and that it may seem challenging on some days, but one thing I've learned in my career is that there are still folks that come to me decades in some cases later to let me know about a particular seed I helped plant that did eventually sprout. And there are lots of those things out there. It's impossible to track them, but I think that we just have to sometimes, you know, hang up our flat hat, so to speak, at the end of the day and realize that there is a certain amount of the impact that we are having. We'll never know the full extent, but that it does happen and we can see that. And, and we, we are seeing it in, in some of it in real time. And I know that sounds very optimistic. I am but an optim I'm, I'm a pragmatist, but I have my moments of optimism as well, where you know we really are making a difference. And it's by continuing to engage, by continuing, by not giving up on engaging with visitors, no matter how polarized the climate, you know, not telling these stories, presenting these different perspectives, um, even when we get pushback, but recognizing that for every pushback we get, we also get people who are coming to hear that particular angle that may not have come before. And so, and so I think we have to just remember that we need to celebrate the small victories, that this is a long climb to get to this point of saving the world, and that we need to support each other along the way and above all not give up because the minute we that, that we give up on the power of our craft to to make meaning and to impact visitors then we've lost right but i think that we absolutely have the ability to to make a difference and we just have to keep the faith and support each other in in together finding our way through all the different challenges that the future holds and still holds for this field in doing so and perhaps I would um, say as a coda to this uh, wonderful uh, articulate way of, ex of expressing uh, what we do and its role, um, is that perhaps ultimately if, all, if uh, we're asking more questions than we can answer and provoking thought and different ideas and different challenges that uh, we share with humanists and the humanists who participate in things like this discussion panel tonight, uh, our role of investigating human beings, investigating their culture and their different modes of self-expression. And by virtue of doing that, we are in some small way helping to save the world. Well, thank you very much for a wonderfully engaging discussion tonight. I would like to give our panelists an opportunity for any closing thoughts or remarks or shameless plugs or, <laughs> or anything else that you would like to leave our, uh, our very engaged uh, audience tonight. And, uh, Larry, I'd like to start with you. Okay. Uh, I will uh, try and cover all the bases that you offered to us. Um, 
And that is, uh, I'd like to refer to a book that I wrote with Ted Cable titled The Gifts of Interpretation, 15 Guiding Principles for Interpreting Nature and Culture. Now, we won't go over all of the principles uh, and uh, we won't even go over all of the gifts, but uh, to conclude, I'd like to point out that interpretation as a profession bears gifts. And so there's the gift of a spark, that's the first one. There's the gift of story, and there's the gift of provocation. And then the gifts become loftier and loftier, the gift of beauty, and the gift of joy, and the gift of passion. And these are all associated with an interpretive principle. Well, the last of all the gifts is the gift of hope. And so I think this couldn't be more pertinent to our times. And I, I did see that um, someone in the chat had mentioned uh, the notion of raising collective global consciousness. Th there's a concept known as pronoia, and that is that you expect good things to happen. And so like Kelly, I'm an optimist. I, I uh, <laughs> see the world uh, through lens that, you know, uh, miracles uh, to me, you know, the sun came up again. So uh, the, the last gift is hope, and it couldn't be more pertinent to our times. We've addressed some of what's going on without really saying it. And uh, we're, in a, we're living in a precarious moment. And uh, we were talking earlier that um, your institute brought in Nicholas Kristof, who is the New York Times columnist, uh, for one of these events, I guess it was several months ago, I, I, I got to watch uh, some of that event. And he said, we are living in a precarious moment. And I think he is a brilliant and amazing human being. So uh, we need hope right now and we need the action that it inspires for us to take in this precarious moment. He didn't define the precarious moment. I won't define the precarious moment because if we're paying attention, we know what that is. So uh, from this book that, that I wrote with Ted, just a couple of things, um, uh, quotes that I've pulled that I will close with, hope for something better drives the possibility of it happening. Hope raises our awareness and motivates us in the right direction. Interpreters can offer hopeful messages while acknowledging and confronting the many problems that shape our world. And then this, the beauty of human integrity commemorated in events of the past and the beauty of the intricacies of nature give rise to hope. And these are the tools of the interpreter. These are the tools of the interpreter. So, Given our, our cur current terminology, I believe that interpreters are essential workers. I believe that museums and parks and interpretive sites are essential services, the precise things that we need right now so that we can make a difference. And these things give rise to hope and bring needed change. So going back to that original story um, about the Museum of Art, uh, interpretation is worth more than a million dollars interpretation is priceless. <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry. And uh, may I turn to you, Don, for any closing thoughts? I didn't prepare closing thoughts as eloquently as certainly as, uh, as Dr. Peck did. Uh, so I, I'm, I have lots and lots of things to say. I would just, um, I echo the idea of interpretation as being an agent of hope. Uh, I think as an agent of many things. And I think we need to be conscious of the fact that interpretation is a vehicle. It's a communications process. And it can be a vehicle for many, many things. So there, it is not inherently hopeful. And so we have to take responsibility for the messages that we communicate and the feelings that we impart and the subjects we choose to talk about and the people we choose to hire and all of those things. Right? So we need to take responsibility for those things and recognize that they can inspire many, many different things in people. I guess I'm going to leave it at that. Wonderful place to, to leave it. Thank you so much. And uh, Kelly. Well, I'm just, I feel like I've spoken so much already, but I'm going to say 
in terms of hope, I think that one of the best ways for us to help, help each, for us to be able to continue to do that, to have, to continue to spread hope through interpretation is to support each other in doing that. Because um, these, some of these stories are not easy ones to tell. And I think that the best way for us to be able to be effective is to support each other. And I, there's so much conversation going on in the chat that I really wish we could, we had a, a, a way to be able to dialogue with everyone out there who's watching and keep the conversations going. But I think certainly all of us can appreciate coming out of this, you know, this year and a half of pandemic that um, I think that we can all appreciate the power of connection more than ever before. And I look forward to us finding ways to keep the entire field engaged and talking about these topics, discussing them, working with each other to support each other as we face all the challenges that are headed our way. So I, I, I wanna thank everyone who has commented in the chat and I would love for us to find ways to keep this conversation going on and on um, through, through the next, um, well, just indefinitely, it doesn't have to end. I think that we need to just find ways to, to keep these conversations vital and, and, and use the technology to make them possible across time zones and countries and everything else. So, so I would encourage us to, to do that because I think that we are stronger when we're able to hold each other up. And so that's the way to help spread hope is to keep each other, have each other's backs in this effort and, and keep supporting each other. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, so much to our fine panelists this evening. And thank you again to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research.